Hi there, I'm here with Martin Owen, the principal horn player of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Welcome. Hi. And uh, thank you very much that you found the time for tonight because you, you're going to Spain tomorrow. Yeah, absolute yeah. pleasure though. Thank Anytime. you. So maybe you can tell us a few things about yourself and how you started uh, playing the horn. Yeah, certainly. Um, I wouldn't say that my parents were musical as such, but I mean, my father is, is Welsh, so he always had this, um, the Welsh choir backgrounds and he used to listen to this music um, a lot and his father used to sing in a Welsh choir um, um, my mother uh, she was um, she used to do a lot of ballet dancing when she was young mm -hmm. and uh, and it was always um, a, a big interest of, of hers and uh, with all this uh, comes music of course and uh, my parents were always really interested in Russian music so I yes yeah it, it's well, very interesting actually for me some of the greatest music in the world that's ever been composed um, Prokofiev, for example, the amazing ballet music. Um, we listen to everything from Tchaikovsky to uh, Stravinsky, you know, really uh, quite modern music. Mm -hmm. Certainly for, for my young years at the time, it was, a, it was very interesting to listen to these different kinds of sounds. And the one instrument that really stood out from all of this was, was the French horn, this, this uh, thing sitting here. And um, it, it took quite a long time though. I was, I was um, probably 12, 13 years old before I started playing an instrument. And it was actually my, my grandmother who bought me my first instrument. Oh, really? Wow. Um, yeah, so it was, a, I guess, a, a sort of a bit of a legacy started there. Okay, so you started when you were like 12, 13 years yes, old. Yes, yes, exactly. Is, isn't that quite late to start an instrument or um, for, well, maybe for a classical instrument, not really? Yes, for a, mm. for a classical instrument, I think you'll find a lot of uh, violinists and pianists, they would start playing... Um, maybe at the even age of four or even yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, my brother, he, he started, uh, he's, he's, he's not a musician, but uh, but at the same time, he's a very fine amateur musician. Yeah. <laughs> and he started playing the piano um, at the age of two even. Wow. And yeah, he was, yeah. Uh, he was incredible. And he moved on to the cello as well, kept the piano going at the same time and uh, yeah. very talented in both. So some people start instruments uh, very early on. As you can see, something like this, you give this to a two-year-old, yeah. And um, <laughs> you'll be taking it to a shop to get it repaired very quickly yeah, because it's yeah. just too big to hold. Um, it's I know, quite delicate, I guess, and, and in certain. Um, in some ways, it is delicate. Yes, mm. I mean, you think it's just a piece of metal, but uh, it is actually quite. Um, it's quite an well, intricate it looks closer, instrument. It, it looks it yeah, all these fine kind of. Well, that's like right. A, all these valves. I yeah. mean, inside inside these each of these cylinders, there's um, a piece of. A metal rectangular which uh, changes the direction according to when you put the valve down oh wow when you put uh, when you put this key down here it changes um, the metal inside the valve okay. to um, to go into this direction um, another 90 degrees right so instead of the air just going all the way through here and mm -hmm. eventually out of the instrument it diverts the air by and the, moving and this, this valve the pitch, I'm missing then. to go down here, yes, to yeah. go down all wow. these these um, these tubes using the valve. So this one is worth one tone. Okay. This one is worth a semitone, mm -hmm. and this one is worth a tone and a half. So each time you press one of these valves, you can change the notes. Right. By doing this, now um. This actually only came in in the year 1815, so just over 200 years ago, mm -hmm. this valve was invented. Before that, you just had basically uh, a piece of metal, conical shaped. By that, I mean it starts very thin and it gradually gets wider yeah. into a flare like this. Uh, trumpets and trombones, um, the metal tends to stay at about the same diameter for mm -hmm. most of the instrument before it flares out. Mm -hmm. And that gives it a slightly brighter sound. Right. When it flares out gradually, it means that it's a little bit softer. And we also put our hand into the flare, into the bell of the instrument, which softens the sound even more, but can create lots of interesting sounds, which I'll okay, we're gonna come talk to that about a little later. Bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, Just a little bit more history about the horn and about there's different names for for the horn. No, there's French horn. And yeah, there's, there's a French horn. Of course, the cor anglais that the mm -hmm. French call. Uh, it's, it's a totally different instrument. It's a, it's like a, a large oboe. Okay. Um, but but it's also pitched in F. Right. <laughs> like this is pitched in F. Right. 
Um, so, uh, so some people get confused by, by these things. But the different types of music that were used in, in these times, they only used the natural harmonics, the natural valves mm. at the time. So um, you used, utilized this harmonic series. So it's like if you had a long piece of tubing or even like a garden hose mm -hmm. and you could um, swing it around really fast, it starts off at one pitch. Yeah. And then as the air rushes past the end of the tube, uh, the faster the air moves, the pitch goes up in right. what is the harmonic series. So okay, we so have a similar thing with the... Yep, look, no fingers, okay. there were the tricks. Oh wow, okay. Just, just, just for nothing. By, yes. Just by how fast you put the air into, yes. the, into the tube, basically. Yes, exactly. Wow. Just and by so using this. So is it this. quite hard then to, to intonate and do the right pitches? It sometimes yes. sometimes it can be quite difficult and because the harmonics are so close right at the very top of the instrument right that makes the horn quite a difficult instrument to play okay um, and the job for us to do is to try and make it easy right so to try and use our skills and with the use of valves as well yeah to try and uh, limit the the danger at the very top of the yeah. instrument so you, you pitch with a with a tempo of the air you, you put into the tube and then if you pitch it with with these ones as well. Yes, so I pitch it with these ones. Okay. If I go back to uh, when the instrument was very very young, um, there was a um, a, a composer um, Johann Sebastian Bach mm -hmm. who really started um, uh, writing very very interesting things for the horn, and it would have looked a little bit different to this modern horn. Yeah. It would have been sort of hollowed out. Sometimes okay. they used um, horns with um, just a few little holes in them, just to really help the pitching. Other times uh, they used um, horns, um, they were sort of Baroque horns. Um, otherwise they would use uh, something that was called a hand horn. Right. So it didn't have any of this stuff in the middle. It was just a tube going all the way through, getting larger out of the flare. Yes. But there would be a place in the middle where you'd have um, slides like this and you could put them in various different lengths according to what pitch you wanted to play. Oh, wow. Interesting. Really so interesting. yeah, very interesting. So at the time they would be playing something like um. Now, as you can hear, I some of those notes are a little bit out of tune. Okay. So in order to change that to the right pitch, I would have to fold my hand. To move the hand. Yes. To, well. So I would have to change like this. So how do you, like, if we... I move it to yeah. close it like this. Wow. But of course, these That's days... It's really challenging. So you've got so many is, kind of factors yeah. to, get, to get one pitch. Well, it's, it's, it's right very challenging. Crazy. And um, I certainly... There are some really amazing people who play these natural horns these yeah. days. It's something that I have to say I, I don't do. But as we have these valves, um, you can play some of this music in the same way. So I'd go... Um, So I would use different, um, I would use the valves to play the same music. Okay. And is, is it more accurate than with the valves? Is it on? Yes. Because it, it's kind of a set yes. change of the pitch. It's right? much more accurate. Mm. And if you start playing the really high things, yeah. um, you can really um, help you use an instrument. This, this particular instrument, um, it has um, an alto key, which makes it, makes it much easier for some of the high notes. Okay. So um, I can attempt some really difficult high tunes, yeah. like another one of the um, Bach pieces, one of yeah. the Brandenburgs that's written for trumpet. Okay. So. You... Wow. So um, and then you can really use the high notes so, to great this effect. Is it, this is the alto um, uh, effect or the alto key. Yes, it, using that, which... it changes the harmonic series, so okay. it all shifts it up. Right. So it means... And where is it on the... It's this one right here. Right, okay. So instead of going... I press this down. Okay. 
Although okay, this kind of very very high writing is um it's not is, very uh, no, uh, it's, it's not, it's it's not no. very successful no. <laughs> when you write it for lots of people all at the same time. Right, right. Um, but it does have its uses for, for, um, for some big, okay. big pieces. Wow, that's so interesting how, yeah, how just this, it needs so much like technique yeah. to, produce, to produce one sound. So when you were young, it, it required a lot of patience and, and practice, I can imagine. Yeah, I think it really did. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it takes a long time. Uh, people say that to master um, any particular art, um, they say you need to invest at least 10,000 hours. Um, yeah. I don't know how many yeah. hours it would be for, for a horn player um, like myself, for a violinist or a pianist. I mean, it's uh, so many more than that even. Although I think as a child, when you when the piano just makes a sound, right? When you press yes. it, I'm guessing if you just pick up a horn for the first time, it's, it's, it takes a little while to make it. It does take a little bit of a while, a yes. And um, I think most people think that you have to really strain and use a lot of pressure to play an instrument like this. And to a certain extent at the beginning, you do that and then you spend the rest of your life trying to just ease off and trying to relax. Yeah. and to um, play with the maximum economy and the maximum efficiency right? so that your lips just come together with the air at the same time to produce a note that you don't feel yeah. is so much why pressure. Why is there a little effort for, for you now? Um, in a, to a certain extent, it doesn't require much effort and okay. I spend most of my life trying to... Um, use as little effort as possible to play because mm. I think that's very important and it's important for your career as well right so you don't um, burn out and um, and do too many things that would be damaging to your body while you mm. play I think mm. it's, it's very important maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, how it's built like it's uh, um, the horn how it's where it's made and uh, maybe a little bit more about Sure. I mean, they have a great um, horn makers now in so many different places. I mean, this this is actually a German instrument, mm -hmm. and it was made um, in Mainz near near Frankfurt, right? In Germany, um, there's a, a long tradition there. They have some very very good British um, makers uh, as well. There's one in particular that's very very fine British um, maker called Paxman as well. The Americans seem to have a whole host of really, really great horns mm -hmm. as well. Um, to a certain extent, if someone makes a really good instrument that seems to be well, well in tune with itself, um, then the different sounds that you will make um, are very personal to each, each player. Right. They will make a very similar sound on each instrument. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Japan, they they make um, very good horns as well. Many many places um, in Europe and um, and overseas now. Right. So a lot of lot of good good makers. Is, um, this, is your uh, horn an old old horn? When did you when did you? Uh, no, this it? particular one is maybe um, just over ten years old. I right. would say so. Um, so it's not not too old. But um, there are some. It depends how people keep their instruments as well. Um, maintenance. If they're yes, maintenance. Yeah. If they're looked after well, some uh, horns uh, could be sixty, seventy years old and mm. still playing in a really good condition and beautifully made. Right. Um, so and others, um, others, they get them straight off the production line. Yeah, it's yeah. like that, and uh, and they it takes maybe a little bit of time to blow in, but um, they come out with really great instruments straight away. Okay. How expensive is a horn? Like um, as far as musical instruments go, not so not so right. expensive, really. Um, a good professional model, you would be looking somewhere um, in pounds, anywhere between um, say six and twelve thousand right. pounds for a, a really good good, good okay. instrument. Um, most commonly, round about the eight or nine thousand pound mark, I would say. Okay. But you know, you can always <clears throat> find second hand, really good second hand instruments for quite a bit less than that. Mm -hmm. And student instruments, you could find for for one thousand pounds, you could find something that was a, a good instrument. You know, mm -hmm. really good to start on for okay. several years. Cool. Uh, let's yeah. move on to um, how do you play the horn? We've we've talked about it a little bit. Maybe we can you can show us some uh, ex uh, some techniques, playing techniques and extended techniques and just the different sounds uh, the horn can make. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I think the horn is one of the reasons why I loved listening to the horn 
is because of this um, big, soft, romantic sound, the romantic tone. I heard, remember hearing a Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, um, and the second movement has a, a solo that starts. <laughs> listening to this thinking wow it's really it gets gets your heart and it's really really interesting and then I remember um, listening to um, some Stravinsky and thinking wow it's a different kind of sound and uh, I thought this is something that was really really quite um quite hard sound for some of this yeah and I remember listening to um And thinking completely wow. different sound, right? And it had um, eight horns all playing in these really interesting chords, and um, and hearing these this amazing sort mm-hmm. of fiery electric sound in the, this uh, Stravinsky Rite of Spring, and so interesting. And then um, I started listening to a lot of uh, German music, and um, it just got more expressive as the music went on, mm. and uh, listening to. Um, Strauss Alpine Symphony, Richard Strauss, and mm-hmm. some of the beautiful tunes in this, and really um, expressive parts that the horn can can do. Um, but uh, as well as that, um, there are so many sounds that that a that a horn can make. Whether you're playing sort of really high or really low, some of them are comical. Maybe you can you can demonstrate a few. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, uh, I remember listening to. Um, uh, well, in, in Alpine Symphony, we talked about um, Alpine Symphony and um, listening to this great tune going... Um, just a counter melody to everything going on but I thought wow isn't this really really beautiful mm-hmm. all these things happening and then so I wanted to hear some more Strauss and then I heard some um, Symphonia Domestica another piece and uh, almost comical flying around um, going on <laughs> strange things like that and um <laughs> sorry that wasn't very good <laughs> strange things like this and then um it went to the one of the highest notes that i've ever heard horn players play um and finishing up on this really really incredibly high note trumpet trumpet register yes an an e on the horn but it's a concert a and so you listen to some of this um really exciting music um, and there was also a composer called um, Robert Schumann who yeah. um, wrote a piece called the Concertstück, the concert piece yeah. for four horns and orchestra. And he was really taking advantage of the fact that the valve, these things, had been invented um, probably uh, from when he wrote it, probably about 20 years before this. But such was the thinking. Nobody really wanted to utilize them in an orchestra. They were saying, oh, it's the equivalent of... Um, of putting a saxophone in an orchestra during the time oh, okay. of, say, Brahms. In so when it, when it got changed, when this was invented, yeah. it wasn't really well respected. No, the, nobody the really wanted to use it. It was, it was too new. It was too, oh, right. too modern okay. in a way. Yeah, yeah. And so he wrote this great, exciting piece. And I think it was performed once and then never or hardly ever again for about another 50 years. People mm-hmm. said it was too difficult because right. it went up to that note that I played uh, okay. earlier. Yeah, yeah. So when something is really, really high like this, and it's sort of, wow. Um, back in the Bach days, when we were talking uh, uh, music from um, uh, around about the 1700s, um, this music, um, it was played on a very different instrument with a different mouthpiece. Mm-hmm. 
this mouthpiece is um, something that has is quite deep. Right. So the sound, it goes through this cup here and um, it helps to produce um, quite a warm, big sound. The mouthpieces they had were very shallow. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a little dip inside instead of um, being channeled out like this. And it was much easier for them to play on a small instrument with a smaller mouthpiece, the higher notes, something a bit more similar to, to a trumpet. Right. So right. that's why there are a lot of really high notes in those days. Yeah. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Very in interesting. Um, other techniques that we use from time to time. Um, if we want um, something that gives a, a note a bit of a sting, um, we can stop the note with the hand. When I say stop or gestoppt in German, Otherwise, we would close it up like this. Yeah. And by doing this, I'm cutting off all the air, apart from just a very little bit that will creep in around my hands. Right. So I'm, I'm literally stopping the air and I have to force the air out, put a lot of pressure through the instrument. Mm -hmm. As I'm doing this, I'm also cutting off the instrument by about this much. So it changes the pitch. Of course, yeah. So when yeah. I do this to a normal note, it will go, Very cinematic. Sounding. Very cinematic, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. Um, I've got this thing here called um, a, a stopping valve as well. So it's a valve that I put down and it changes the pitch for me automatically. So it makes it uh, much easier. I could actually play... Um... I put this valve down and close my hand. Amazing. And I can yeah. change the pitch like this. Yeah. Amazing. So it really sort of makes a, a quite it's a, a, mute, a big difference. It's like difference. A, a muted trumpet sounds kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Muted trumpet. Wow. Um, there's a limit to how low you can do with this. Um, we could go. So you can get a certain um, amount of air through the instrument like this when it's quite low. Yeah. But it's it doesn't have that real sting that you get higher. So you can play quite high with this sound as well, yeah. but it's very, very interesting. If the composer wants something that's really um, a little bit aggressive and angry, instead of just playing... I can then flutter tongue. I can, instead of going... Da, 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 I can play... Dra, 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 dra. Right. So I play... Like this. It sounds much harsher. In much harsher, mm. yes. Yes. And it's really interesting if you play mm. a normal tune or something. And I want to make it sound very aggressive. I can play. Yeah. Something that has a real, real mm. sort of snarl to it. Mm. Very, very um, aggressive sound. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, a few interesting different sounds there. Yeah. Could you talk us through a technique called bells up? Certainly. Uh, so normally I would play in a position which is quite well balanced. The horn will be at this height. And um, as it's facing backwards, of course, uh, it takes a little bit of a while for the sound to come through. The effect um, is um, usually quite rounded unless I'm playing really loud. But to assist with that, if I lift the bell and lift the whole instrument up to this height, uh, then it really helps the brightness of the sound come through and it really increases the volume. Mm -hmm. uh, less of the sound goes down and hits the floor around this area and more of it goes upwards and out over the top. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a technique I think quite a few composers uh, would write for in the classical music world and of course uh, film composers if they really want something that's fiery and powerful. I'll give you a demonstration of the differences of the same excerpt. Uh, I'll choose maybe a, a piece of um, Mahler, good, loud, romantic music. Mm -hmm. So.
Now, if I want to make that even louder and even brighter, then I would play with my hand a little bit more open and with the horn up like this, and the same music. So you hear that such a much a more strong, powerful, powerful yeah. sound. I wouldn't say it was necessarily more beautiful, but if you really want the horn to cut across the orchestra, that would really help. Yeah, yeah. Um, other techniques, as one, um, a mute. This is a fiber mute. Um, they also, a lot of composers, they write for a metal mute um, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, a metal mute is just something that's um, quite small, but to be perfectly honest, has exactly the same sound as using your hand in the bell. So it transforms the note from that's the sound when yeah. for, so a lot of the time if a composer asks for a metal mute, that's the sound they want to hear, something yeah. that is quite metallic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. quite, quite edgy. Um, the the fibre mute is something which, um, it softens the sound a little bit, but at the same time, it takes away a little bit of this warmth and it makes it sound quite far away. So if I want to play something a little bit um, fanfare-y, perhaps. Um... Now, they might think, okay, that's very nice, it's very pleasant. Can we make it sound like it's in the distance? So I would use the fiber mute and the sound is transformed. Yeah. So it's yeah. quite an interesting feeling. Mm -hmm. um, you could play a melodic line with one of these as well and to make it sound um, quite far away. So if I use this. So it really gives the impression that it's uh, in the distance. Yeah. It's quite yeah. a nice effect. Yeah. If I'm using this um, very high, it can have quite um, a strong, almost astringent feel to right. the notes. So again, it can have a little bit of an edge, yeah. or it quite can be quite sound, soft. Quite actually. a unique yeah. sound. Yeah. And if I play low as well. So it can have um, quite a sort of cutting quality, or it can be very soft. So a little bit different to if you I was just playing. you find yourself using it a lot or, or more in classical music or more in film music? Uh, not or? so much in classical music, mm. but um, in film music, um, I think a lot of composers, they really want the, the variety of sound according yeah. to what's going on in the picture. And so we tend to use a lot of different techniques now right. when we play. Um, sometimes if you have something um, fast, then we will use maybe a little bit of um, double tugging. Right. So. So something that just gives it a little bit more of a drive and to mm. sound a little bit more like um, a trumpet, especially if it was quite high. Okay. Um, uh, triple tonguing again. Uh, it's it's something that is uh, even more from the, from the trumpet world. It it sounds a little bit like it. Um, we hardly ever use it. Right. But um, sometimes if you're playing, um, yeah. something you can have um, a bit more of an effect mm -hmm. um, by, uh, by utilizing some of this. Um, yeah. But um, to be perfectly honest, I think it usually sounds a little bit better on woodwind <laughs> than it would, <laughs> would um, yeah. on, on the horn. So, and, and flat the tongue we've talked about. Yes, that's yeah. when you wanted to make it sound uh, more. Yes, you can harsh. combine all these things, of course. Yeah. 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 
and do lots of different um, techniques. Um, double stops are something that occasionally um, may be utilized, but it doesn't really work very well because it means that we have to actually sing down yeah. the instrument to try and create any kind of um, chord. And usually Sounds it's just a fifth. interesting, maybe you can I'll give us a little yes. example. So the bass notes would be, um, for example, if I played an E on the horn. And then I would try and sing about a fifth, a fifth or a fourth or even a sixth to try and get some different notes around it. Very useful in cinematic music. <coughs> Very useful. It's not terribly yeah. user friendly because, as you can tell, it does make you yeah. want to cough a little bit as well. I won't make, make you do it again. <laughs> um, I certainly, I usually find that uh, the, the trombones and uh, some of the lower instruments, um, they, they tend to be able to do this um, very successfully. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the horn, it does work, but not so, not so not well. Incredibly well. Yeah, mm -hmm. not incredibly well. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, what's, how is it best to write for, for the horn, or what, what are some common errors you encounter in, in, in kind of the film world or amongst the yeah, composers? Yeah, I, I would say I, probably the biggest complaint from um, horn players, especially if the section is quite small, if you only have sort of two or three or four horn players, um, the horns are often utilised as um, padding. Yeah. So um, something that will bulk up the chords and, and, uh, with the strings as well. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's really beautiful. But on some pieces, particularly if they tend to be quite heavy and loud, um, you can get big, long sections just with long, long, long notes. And it never stops. There's never a chance to breathe. And so when you're recording this music, uh, often they will say, um, come on, uh, can we just have it completely smooth? Can we not have any breaks? And they say, well, you have to breathe. Yeah. So you'll be playing something, you'll be playing. Just imagine if you have to play this all the time like this and you have to take a breath and come in again and um, then you record this several times and it's a long day and you have so much more to record, it can get incredibly tiring, incredibly yeah. wearing. Yeah. And so maybe um, with larger sections, of course, it's a little bit better to utilize the horn in, in a way where you can um, have some Breathe bars off. Breathe at different times. Breathe well. at different times, mm -hmm. but also... Um, take some bars off here and there and uh, let some of the others um, do the work. Because yeah. a lot of the time um, a chord is transferred into the section and then the poor guys that are playing the high parts, they just have to keep on going all the time. So, so would you say it, it, it also helps like, if you have, like, let's say, three players to um, change between like, writing high and low? Like, so yeah. that not always the same player plays, yeah, plays exactly. the high notes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think it's a good idea mm. to just uh, to change and swap between. and uh, But also um, the kind of uh, sound they really uh, want to want to create, to really think about um, having sometimes too much, yeah. being flooded. Uh, sometimes an orchestra is really flooded. It's too complicated. Everything is happening all at the same mm. time when actually it doesn't really need to be like that. So less, so, less is more. Yeah, I think sometimes less is more. We yeah. can thin it out sometimes. Um, other um, technical um, difficulties, I get uh, sometimes um, when they want um, a stopped note or changing to when you fold the hand into the horn, um, just the way writing it, I've seen it often where they want the sound to be and then straight away changed to the note that's lower, but open again. Uh. And it doesn't really work. It only works the other way around. So um, that's a consideration, to that the note goes lower when you fold the hand in. So and it's easier to do that rather than... Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, 
So this is this is something that does uh, come up in music yeah. uh, quite a lot yeah. from time to time. Um, otherwise, I mean, I have to be honest. I think most of the music we always find a way to play it, yeah. even if we have some real difficulties. Um, technical difficulties, whether it's fast or high or low. Mm. Uh, these days, the standard is so high of horn players all over the place yeah. um, that um, there's rarely any sort of real problems. But I still think it's quite wise to keep the music within um, the range of, um, say, from... From down for this octave, then... So um, a top C for my instrument, which is a concert F, yeah. that's usually the accepted range. Um, right. Occasionally a few composers have written um, a little bit higher. I remember recording some of the Pirates of the Caribbean for Hans Zimmer, mm -hmm. where it was um, very tough sessions. And we had to play, uh, I think, a semitone above this for some of the tunes. Um, we had to yeah. play a, a tune like this, um, and um, it's it, sound, it sounded fine when you just played it. <laughs> I'm sure that was luck. Um, but uh, when when you're recording and and uh, it goes on and on and on, and you constantly have to play these tunes, um, then there is um there is a, a shelf life of how long you can keep doing it for. Yeah, and that's the difficult thing. Sometimes right. mm -hmm. something can look quite manageable, maybe to play once. Um, right. So we need to be, I think, just a little bit careful sometimes um, that uh, the music that is written and the way we play the music as well in the sessions that we always have to save something so mm -hmm. that you never you never run out of fuel you never reach empty yeah so i think that's quite important really as far as the horn goes okay uh well i think if you if you have anything to add to to a, a technique or any tips how to write for a <laughs> horn for a for a for an aspiring composer or well um i think the horn should really be used um at what it's good for um, it's the softest sounding brass instrument and when you have many horns playing together it can create glorious sweeping tunes yeah. that will soar over the orchestra and really this is how it should be used as a really heroic one minute but um, soft and romantic and beautiful the next. Mm -hmm. um, the horn is really meant for playing beautiful tunes. Yeah. And um, other instruments are good at doing uh, different things. Some, some of the same as well. But um, I, for me, that's really what the instrument is for. That's what it stands for. Okay. Thank you very much. No, absolute Martin pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.